dropped Carla off at her bungalow and headed home to shower and call Lash. What now, Morno? His greeting was laced with irritation. Case getting away from you, Sarge? I asked, staring at the briefcase on my couch. I'd pulled it from the trunk of the sedan, but hadn't screwed up the internal fortitude to open it. I'm hanging up, Lash warned. I'm guessing you haven't been out to the Wayne Grove place, because if you had, you would have found a set of knives that look a lot like the one used to kill the ball woman, I told him. Huh, I'm a long way from a search warrant. Guess I could go out there tomorrow and see if I can find something to talk about. Was Stanley there? No, just Sally and her emotionally stunted 30-year-old son. I heard Wayne Grove left Kalamazoo. Thought he'd be home by now, Lash said, mostly to himself. Based on his condition the last time I saw him, he might have driven into a ditch somewhere. I told Lash about the scene at the buckboard. I'll get out there with Murkowski tomorrow, and we'll see what we see. We came up with nothing on that print, but neither of the Wayne Groves have any priors, Lash said. I told him about Carla stealing the toothbrushes, and we had a good laugh about it. That assistant of yours is something, Lash said. Yes, yeah, she's something, all right. I told him I'd talk to him tomorrow, then hung up, trying to ignore the briefcase mocking me from across the room. Pure cowardice is what made me grab the thing and tuck it under my computer desk. It's what made me pull on jeans and a shirt, lock the apartment behind me, and head over to the meanwhile on foot. It was going to be one of those nights. I wouldn't be driving home. I'd traversed those twelve blocks countless times, in every state of inebriation, from highly buzzed to minutes shy of a blackout. My feet knew the way like salmon know they need to swim upstream once a year. I walked in and saw Carla sitting at the bar, having what looked like an interesting conversation with my friend, Muggs. He leaned in and smiled at something she was saying. It jostled something inside me I wasn't prepared to have jostled. He saw me first, kept his eyes on me as I approached. Carla turned around. She was wearing shorts, a crisp white t-shirt, and her sneaker-clad feet were perched on the rungs of the stool on either side. Hey, Morno. Fancy meeting you here. She said with a lazy smile. She put a hand on my arm. Come on, cop a squat. Settle a bet, will ya? I slid around the other side of her and took the stool to her right, mainly to get her hand off me. What's the bet? I asked as Muggs poured me a scotch. Muggs opened his mouth to say something, but Carla held up a hand to stop it. Then she turned to me. Which American president had a raccoon? I shook my head, took a sip of my drink. Muggs is an avid acquirer of useless trivia. I've lost count of how many times I've seen him settle an impending bar fight with a round of drinks for the guy who could answer a trivia question. They rarely could, but it was a good distraction and both parties always ended up with a free drink. I'd heard this one before, so I said, Calvin Coolidge. Raccoon was named Rebecca. Yes. Carla put her arms in the air and did a seated victory dance, wiggling her butt around on the stool. Trying not to smile, Mug said, You've got the president right, but you said trifecta, not Rebecca. I did not. Carla seemed pretty certain. Muggs looked to a gray-haired man at the end of the bar for confirmation. The man nodded and frowned apologetically at Carla. I did not. Why would I say perfecta? That's stupid. She was having a little trouble keeping her P's, T's, and R's from getting away from her. When she said perfecta, both Muggs and the old guy busted up. Okay, fine. I'm a little tipsy. Carla admitted, then suddenly thought of something that made her gasp. Oh, great. Now I gotta call a cab. They don't really like coming to this side of town. Do you guys know that? Last time I called one out here, 
The driver made me agree to pay triple before he would come. That's discrimination. I mean, I was bad out there and everything. Most days I expect to see the four horsemen of the apocalypse riding down Dexter Avenue, but still, a gal should be able to get a cab home from a bar without getting ripped off, right? The gray-haired guy said. Hey, I'll have one of those mugs. Set him up. He motioned to himself, then Carla, and me. One of what? I shook my head. She's had enough. I looked at Muggs. He pointed to Carla's beard, held up two fingers, and grinned. Two beers, and she was a drunken, chatty Kathy. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, the gray haired guy said. You're calling a cab anyway. What you say? You don't want one of those, Muggs told her. I'll get you another beer. He turned around to grab one. No, I want one. Give me one of them four horsemen thingies. Don't. Carla swatted my warning away. Bartender, I believe you have our order. Line him up. Mug sighed, pulled out three shot glasses, and set them on the bar in front of me. He deftly poured from four bottles, two at a time. One part Jim, one part Jack, one part Johnny Red, and a kicker of Jameson. He slid a shot glass in front of each of us. I hope your toilet's clean because it's no fun puking into a sully pot, I told her before downing mine. The man at the end of the bar did the same, then slammed the glass on the counter and said, Damn! He performed what looked like a full-body mini-convulsion then added, Felt that in my nuts. Carla picked up the drink and eyed it for a minute, then took a deep breath and shot it like a champ. Then her eyes bulged, and she stuck out her tongue, dry heaving. <coughs> Muggs backed up as I grabbed her shoulders and swiveled her around to point the impending projectile event toward the floor. Carla took a deep, ragged breath, slowly turning back around. Nope, I'm good. But maybe you should call me that cab now, Muggs. She shivered and slid off her stool, holding her keys up. I gotta go get my purse out of my car. I'll be right back. I watched her walk out the door. Muggs said, I like her. Try not to run her off, or wear her down, or break her spirit, or whatever it is you do with women. Be a little less you with that one. He picked up the phone to call the taxi. I headed outside to make sure Carla didn't take a header into the street. The bar was on the corner, and I didn't see her Honda, so I figured she parked on the side alley that led to the next block. I rounded the corner in time to see a tall, hulking shadow lumber toward her and grab a handful of her hair. His face was concealed with a red ski mask, and I distinctly made out a glint of a knife blade gripped in his other hand. Hey! I screamed to distract him, closing the distance between us by more than half as his head jerked in my direction. He took off down the alley and I followed. I could hear Carla running behind me, screaming my name. But everything dissolved into a black rage that boiled up in my head like the sound of an approaching tornado. I was a couple of feet from him when an agonized cry cut through the black noise. I heard Carla go down behind me. Oh shit, fuck, fuck, oh, oh god, oh. She was choking out wounded animal sounds by the time I slid to a stop and bent down next to her. Oh shit, shit, god damn it. She was panting, and even in the shaft of illumination coming from the light across the street, oh, I can oh, see her color was bad, and her kneecap was absolutely oh, God, not in the position a kneecap is supposed to be. Oh. It stuck out to the left of her leg. Oh, God. This used to happen all the time when I was a kid. Fuck. Shit. She labored Fuck. to get out every word. What up, Mordo? You're going to have to pop it back in. Oh, Jesus. Fuck, it hurts. When I reached out to touch her, she screamed. No, no, don't touch me. She took a few oh, deep fuck. breaths and said, Fuck. You have to put your left hand on my cap. No, don't fucking touch me. I just listen. I jerked my hand away. Left hand on my calf. Your right hand has to firmly grasp my kneecap. 
Oh god, oh god. Moro. <sighs> she blew a few quick breaths out of her mouth. Fuck. Okay, it's an all or nothing thing, Morno. You gotta straighten my leg with your left hand while you pop the knee in place with your right. Carla. Oh god. Man, the fuck up. Left hand calf, right hand knee. One smooth movement. Oh, oh I think I'm gonna be sick. Oh. Her hair was plastered to her sweaty forehead. Oh. Okay, tell me when. Oh, fuck. She closed her eyes, fuck. clenched her fists, let her head fall back between her shoulder blades, oh. and screamed, Do it! I firmly jerked her leg straight as I pushed the kneecap back into place. Oh. There was a bony click that I felt rather than heard at the exact moment she screamed and fell onto her back. Then she rolled over onto her side and puked. Did the guy say anything to you? I asked, as I got Carla set up on my couch. I didn't want her going back to her place until I had a chance to swing by and check it out. I'd already called Lash. He was on his way to the Wayne Grove place, and I was in a hurry to get out there. I gently lifted her leg and slid a pillow under the crook behind her bad knee. She winced. I'm fucking puta. Sorry. I winced along with her. I still couldn't get the image of her dislocated knee out of my head. It looked too much like the leg of the ex-husband in that crime scene photo. No, that's what the guy said, fucking puta. Her face tensed and she closed her eyes as she adjusted herself to a comfortable position. That stopped me for a minute. My gut told me it was Stanley. But he could have sent one of the workers to scare her out of retaliation for the bar incident. He had nothing else to gain by doing it, as far as I could see. What, you think it's Stanley? He sent one of those illegal workers? Yeah, maybe. Still, something didn't feel right. Those guys were long gone if they knew what was good for them. Not getting paid was one thing. Getting picked up by INS was another. I doubted Stanley was in any hurry to pay them for their last week of work. But it was possible he'd become friendly with at least one or two of them. Friendly enough to ask for a favor in return for final payment of their wages. I set a glass of water on the coffee table and pushed the table closer so she could reach it. Need anything else? I'll be fine. Unless I gotta pee. She looked pained, even thinking about standing up. I went to the hall closet and pulled out a set of crutches. Broke my foot last year. I unscrewed the bolts and adjusted them for her shorter height as best as I could estimate. She looked around the apartment and I suddenly saw it through her eyes. Wood paneling, old furniture, an inch of dust covering everything. Dark, dank, and dreary. Sorry, no TV. Got rid of it when I realized I was paying for 247 channels but could never find anything interesting enough to watch. Do you have any copies of your last book? I think I'm about halfway through. Reading helps me fall asleep. I went to the bookshelf and pulled it out, wiped the dust off on my pant leg and set it on the coffee table. Then I grabbed her purse from where I'd dropped it by the door and set it on the table next to her in case she needed anything in it. I shouldn't be long. I'm going to bolt the door. I don't generally get visitors, so if someone knocks at this time of night, best not to answer it. She looked nervous, so I added, Don't worry. Nobody's getting through that door. Try and get some sleep. I locked her in and headed downstairs. First stop, her house. I wanted to see if it looked like anyone had been nosing around there. It took me 20 minutes to drive over, use the key I'd made to get inside, and ascertain that everything appeared to be as it was the last time I was there. No signs of forced entry. All the windows were closed and locked. Even the garage was locked from the inside, as was the door leading from there into the kitchen. I made my way back through the house locking everything back up behind me. Then I jumped back in my car and was in the Wayne Grove driveway 15 minutes later. Lash met me as I pulled up. I don't think it was him, Lash said as I got out of the car. Hey, let me talk to him, I said. As long as talk isn't a euphemism for beating the shit out of him. 
Lash followed me toward the barn. His car was cold when I got here. Hadn't been driven recently. He's drunk off his ass. I could hear a guitar coming from the barn. Someone could have driven him, I said. Or he could have sent someone else. Carla said the guy said fucking Puda. So, it wasn't him, Lash said warily. He could have picked up that much vernacular at the work site. Or HBO, I said, entering the barn. Stanley sat in his boat, shirtless. I walked around to where he was sitting in the captain's chair, grabbed the guitar, and slammed it outside of the boat, sending splinters flying. What the fuck, man? Stanley bolted up and flicked the guitar back at my head. Lash stood at the barn door with his arms crossed. He looked less than amused, but not particularly concerned either. Where have you been tonight, Stanley? I asked, sitting down on a bale of hay. Stanley spread his hands out and smiled. Right here, man. Right here. I'd hate to think you were anywhere near the meanwhile tonight, Stanley. You or any of your friends, I said. Sally can vouch for me. She's asleep. You can ask her tomorrow. He sat back down in the captain's chair and propped his feet up on the seat directly across from it with his back to me. I stood up and leaned against the boat behind him. I think we'll wake her up and ask. I wrapped my arm around his neck and dragged him out of the boat, making sure it was as bumpy a ride as possible before he landed on the ground. He immediately sprang up. Fucking touch me again, Morno, he said through gritted teeth, his face an inch from mine. You need to brush your teeth, Stanley. I turned my back on him, a calculated move meant to elicit one from him. When he grabbed my shoulder, I swiveled around and popped him in the jaw. He toppled backwards over a bale of hay. You better get him off my fucking property. That's enough, Lash said as Stanley clambered toward me. Stanley was livid. He looked like he was trying to decide if retaliating in front of the cop was a good idea. Let's go, Morno. Stanley, come on in and get your wife out of bed. I need to ask her a couple of questions, Lash ordered. <laughs> Sally Wingrove did not appear to be a light sleeper. She shuffled out of the bedroom, her hair a frizzy mass of cotton candy around her puffy face, plastered flat to her head in the back, and dark circles under her eyes. What's going on? She rubbed her face and stared at Lash, then at me. What time did Stanley get home tonight? Lash asked, pointing to Stanley and shaking his head when he started to say something. Around eight, I think. What's going on? She went over to sit next to her husband, pulling the cigarette from his mouth and taking a puff. Did he leave the farm for any reason after he arrived? Lash asked, pacing a slow trail from the living room to the adjoining kitchen and looking around casually. Sally looked at Stanley. Sally, look at me, I said, trying to distract them from Lash's meandering. Sally jerked her head from her husband to me. What? Did Stanley leave after he got home from the job site? She shrugged and blew twin plumes of smoke out of her nose. Nope, here all night. When did you go to bed? I continued, buying Lash as much time as I could. Uh, let's see. She glanced at the Budweiser clock mounted over the kitchen entryway. The time read 1147. About an hour ago, I guess. I could tell she was making it up as she went along. My guess was she'd been asleep for a while. Sally, you ever meet any of the guys from the work site? I asked, noticing Stanley stiffened next to her. She made a sour face. Hell no. Another lie. I knew she'd met at least a couple at the Deckard barbecue. Lash came out of the kitchen and sighed. You heard the lady, Morneau. He's been here all night. Let's let them get some sleep. 
Sorry for troubling you, ma'am. Then he turned to Stanley. I'm going to need you down at the station tomorrow. INS has some questions for you. Nine o'clock. Stanley shrugged and blew out a lungful of smoke. Fine with me. When we were halfway to our cars, Lash said, That knife set looked right. I'm calling a judge who owes me a favor. He checked his watch. Damn. He's not going to be happy about getting a call after midnight. But I'd like to get a warrant for the house before those two brain trusts get any bright ideas about getting rid of possible evidence. He said he'd call tomorrow, and we headed out. I was beat as I unlocked my apartment door. But as soon as I saw Carla, every muscle in my body tensed. She was sitting upright on my couch, staring blankly at me. The contents of the briefcase splayed out around her. Some of the pages had slid off the couch and onto the floor around her feet. The crime scene photos were on the coffee table, five of them. Carla. She didn't take her eyes off me. Didn't or couldn't. I wasn't sure. She looked confused, like a character from the wrong script had suddenly walked into a story it didn't belong in. Carla. Her eyes didn't move. She continued to stare at me with parted lips, as if an unspoken plea had taken root inside her, but evaporated before she could speak it aloud. I slowly moved into the room and closed the door behind me, engaging the deadbolt. As I walked out of her field of vision, her eyes didn't track, didn't move beyond the spot on the door where she continued to stare. I knelt down and began picking up the papers, aware of every scrape they made against one another, unsure what would happen if she snapped out of her trance. I had an ominous feeling that on the other side of the blankness, lurked something far worse than silence. I slid the crime scene photos off the table and buried them in a pile of reports, then reached out to gather the pages next to her on the couch. She gasped, a ragged sound, like someone rising to the surface after being underwater a long time. Her body began to tremble, her teeth chattered and her eyes widened, but she still wouldn't acknowledge my presence. I retrieved the rest of the pages from the couch and added them to the pile, grabbing a few that had fallen under the table, and shoved them all into the briefcase and closed it. I took it to my bedroom and put it in the back of my closet, then went into the bathroom and opened the medicine cabinet, foraging from my bottle of sleeping pills. I poured one into my hand, put the lid back on, and returned the bottle to the cabinet. Back in the living room, I knelt in front of her, put the glass of water I'd poured earlier into her hand. She looked down at it, then up at me, and I quickly popped a pill in her mouth, then guided the glass with her hand wrapped around it to her lips. She swallowed a few sips. I took the glass and set it on the coffee table. Then I watched her. She never looked at me, not once. Never pulled her gaze away from some spot on a wall just over my shoulder. But there were emotions simmering there, just under the surface of the blankness, in the space between her eyes, in the tremor of her chin. The color of grief is a prism. The crimson red of self-hate, the pale yellow of cowardice, the light blue of sadness, blackness of despair, the bright orange recrimination of guilt, the purple rage and gray confusion. Eventually, her shivering subsided. Her eyes began to droop and she'd almost fall asleep. I went over, lifted her up, and carried her to my bed. Like a child, she let me guide her under the covers, pulled them up over her, then she rolled onto her side, away from me. I left the bedroom door open a crack and went into the kitchen, poured a glass of scotch, downed it, and then another. That's when I realized how angry I was. Angry at myself for not thinking about the briefcase when I left her alone. 
Angry for ordering the file in the first place. Angry for making that copy of her key and breaking into her house. Angry that I had the nerve to rifle through her life, treating it like a pile of trash out on the curb, open for inspection. My jaw was stiff, the muscles in my shoulders and forearms burned. It felt like something toxic was brewing inside me with all that anger and no way to get it out. I paced a circle around my kitchen and set down the empty glass when I realized I wanted to shatter it in my hand. Like a mouth waters for something it desires, I craved the feeling of glass ripping through my skin. Then I saw the open cabinet, but I knew it wouldn't work. Only one door in the house would. So I disengaged the deadbolt, opened the door, slid into the hallway, took the doorknob in my left hand, grabbed the door frame with my right hand, and yanked back with my left as hard as I could. The pain was blinding sweet, the agony of relief. Trudy cracked her door open across the hall and came up behind me. Go back inside, I told her. I'd broken out in a cold sweat. She put her hand on my shoulder. Go. It had a quietly dangerous resonance that crashed over her like a breaking way, sending her back into her apartment. But she closed the door slowly. I could feel her staring at my back as I slammed the door on my hand two more times. There is something about sickness and pain. Just as water seeks its own level and cannot sustain tangential force, those with damage will always hover on the periphery, seeking to find their own level. Anger is red, and unlike nature's gold, it's the easiest hue to hold. If you've already got your share of nicks and cracks from life, having her vulgar way with you, anger can seep into those crevices like molten lava and harden you. I've seen it in vets, I've seen it in cops and firefighters, and I've seen it on the surrendered faces walking around the streets of Detroit. It's something you can't miss, and if the day ever comes when I see it in the mirror, I will make that my last day. The pain of icing my swollen hand brought a different kind of relief. The throbbing subsided to numbness as the adrenaline high dissipated, leaving me too spent to nourish the anger. I fell asleep sitting on the couch with my head leaning against the wall, but I woke with more of a feeling of a sound than the actual sound. A change in the energy of the apartment. I stood at the bedroom door and listened to the low hum of her agony take over, where the blankness had left off. It was a quiet keening, a moan she hadn't quite relinquished herself to, because like me, Carla knew pain could seep into the crevices just like anger, but pain only seeks capitulation. Pain is far more dangerous than anger when directed inward. I towed off my shoes and lay down next to her, on top of the blanket. I didn't feel I'd earned the right to console her by saying anything, or even touching her. I turned on my side and eased my back against hers, then slid my busted hand under the heaviest part of my leg. It seemed a logical sort of symmetry, and it was all I had to give 